Um, I will start with someone that you already heard from today, Jamila Johnson, who's the Deputy Director <laughs> at the Promise of Justice Initiative. She oversees policy work and special projects, such as PJI's Jim Crow Juries Project and the End Plantation Prisons Project. You've heard Brandon, your mom, talk about the evolution from slavery to prison. Ending Plantation Prisons Project. We'll hear more about that. Before joining PJI, Jamila led the Louisiana Criminal Justice Reform Team at the Southern Poverty Law Center and served on the steering committee for the unanimous jury coalition, ununanimous jury, un, 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 unanimous jury, yeah, the unanimous jury coalition. It's the unanimous, but it's against the not, got it, the unanimous jury coalition as it ran the campaign to amend Louisiana Constitution to require unanimous juries. Additionally, she's been in leadership for Louisianans for Prison Alternative since 2017. Jamila has a law degree from the University of Washington School of Law and spent a decade at the Pacific Northwest law firm Schwab, Williamson, and Wyatt, where she was a constitutional litigator and firm partner. And my colleague, Angelo Guisado, is a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where he specializes in government misconduct, racial justice, and immigrants' rights issues, his practice currently focuses on challenging oppressive state power and the, not, the denial of migrants' rights at the U.S.-Mexico border. Outside of the courtroom, his advocacy efforts have allowed him to support and collaborate with groups such as No More Deaths, No New Jails, and Migrant Justice. Prior to coming to CCR, he practiced at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, LLP. Lots of names there where he litigated cases in federal and state courts across a broad docket. He's a graduate of Fordham University School of Law, cum laude, and a former law clerk to the late Judge Damon Keith of the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Sixth Circuit. Jeremy Young is a senior producer with Fault Lines, which is the documentary program on Al Jazeera English. He collaborated with The Lens, a nonprofit new newsroom here in New Orleans, on this project that you just saw. He was nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Crime and Justice Coverage. Jeremy. And last, but certainly not least, Mr. Jackson might not need a formal introduction because it's his life story that we watched tonight. You can sit wherever you want. In February of this year, after more than 25 years behind bars, he was finally now that he is out, he is continuing to fight to get the law changed here in Louisiana, and it is such an honor to be here with you tonight. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Yeah. Folks can hear us? Yeah? Do we need the mic maybe a little yes, bit? Yes. It's better with the mic. I think it's going to work. How's this? Nope. Hello. The bottom part. Try this one? The bottom part. Tech. Appreciate you. There we go. Yes. Oh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Shout out to Tech. Um, friends, I, I had questions. Um, I had a lot of questions before, and now I kind of just want to just want to open it up and I I want to start with you Brandon welcome home Thank you. and there's I have a couple questions but first can you tell us about your mom first of all I want to thank God for allowing all of us to even be here today especially me especially my mom She's still above ground, even though she said that she wasn't going to make it. God wasn't ready to bring her home, so she's still there. Um, and if you don't mind, I would like for her to talk to you all because you all to me are considered family because you're here. Yes. Hello? <gasps> Hello? Ma? They right here. Hold on. Your family here. Hold on. Oh my God. You can, you can talk to them and say hello. Y'all can say hello to my mom. Hi, Hi Mom! Hey. Thank 
Thank you for standing by his side. Yes. All right. I love you. I just wanted you to say hello, and I want them to say hello to you. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Love you, too. We love you, Mama. Bye, Miss Molly. That's Jeremy right there. Everybody talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought... Big Jeremy. Yeah, that's Big Jeremy. That's not Little Jeremy. Okay. And Ms. Jamila and every PJI, CCR, Rob, Fox, all of them, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Okay, baby. You take care now. All right. I love you. I'll talk to you later. Love you, Ma. sitting here after going through what I went through, having a life sentence. And that just assures me that my God sits high and looks low. Um, when I came in, they had a young lady ask me how did it feel. I didn't, I'm not going to put on the spot. It's like I I never put anybody else on the spot. But Brandon, hold the mic up closer. Just, just for, I guess, um, a few minutes i just would like everybody to close your eyes so you can understand how i felt i want you to really understand how i'm, I'm about to present this to you and i just want everybody to close their eyes right now how i felt was you have a husband and wife you have a significant other um and the female she becomes pregnant carry her child for nine months. She has that that child. She gives birth to that child. And we all know that sooner or later, the nurses will take that child away from their mother to go wash their child up, put, a, put the child in the incubator. Now it comes time where the mother walks down the hall or get pushed in a wheelchair down the hall. The father's with the, the mother Matter of fact, he's pushing her. And you go to set your eyes on that child for the first time when that child was taken away from that mom, only to be told that that child is missing, mm -hmm. that child is not there. Do you, can you even imagine how that mother and how that father would feel? Because those things happen right now in this world with, with, with human trafficking being taken away and placed somewhere that you don't want to be, that you don't need to be, that you didn't do anything to cause yourself to be put in that place or that predicament. That's how I felt. And right now, I see there as a man who's full of life, excited about the future and what to come. I came from a, a good two-parent household, but full of promises. And, and even though that wasn't my biological father, he raised me, uh, but eventually my mom, she became my everything. She became my mom. She became my father, my best friend, my everything. Uh, and when I got incarcerated, my mom was running track and right now you know she can barely walk you know she she need help just to stand up sometimes but uh god is good i stand here and sit here as a man i made mistakes i made bad decisions i made bad short choices i stand here as a man who was lied on i stand here as a man a black man that society basically feared and because of that fear they, they 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 do what they do best they lock you up and they throw away the key and that's why i fight so hard that's why when i was released february 11th i, I haven't stopped running and i'm not going to stop running until we can get some of these laws changed 
especially especially the Jim Crow law, one that was put in place to silence, stop us from voting. And like my mom said, you know, I, I, I never turn this into a, a race thing because the Lord, the Lord showed me, and I, and I was always brought up that, you know, there's there's a there's a overflow of good white people, and there's there's some bad black people too. So, we you know, we gotta we gotta step out of that um, old mentality of always blaming it on the next race when we can get out and do some things for ourselves. First, we 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 have to come we have to come together in unity. Like we are here tonight, we, 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 we have to come together in unity. We have to fight for all the causes that need to be fought for. It's like they got 1,500 more prisoners that's being affected by the non-unanimous jury. And that's one, of the, that's one of the laws that I want to fight. That's one of the laws that I want to put forth or help put forth with the help of all of you and people that's behind the scenes, the people that I don't know because it is big, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than us. And that's when when you make a, a, a ruling that a law is unconstitutional, it should be just that, unconstitutional. It shouldn't it shouldn't be split in half, meaning this half is retroactive and this half is pers perspective. If it's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional for all. That's right. <clears throat> not, not. Don't just let half benefit because the, the 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 part that's benefiting from it might have more heinous cases. Not saying that they're guilty than the ones that have been locked up 25, 30, 40, 50 years. Thanks, Brandon. And 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 the motor bill, the habitual offender. Hey, it's a it's a lot of laws that. We need to challenge. There's a lot of laws that we need to try to change, that we're going to change Amen. If, if everybody come together. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. And we're going to have a chance also to talk more about Step Brothers, what you're doing, the laws that you're, that we're all going to be joining to work against for sure. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your mom with us. I love that she was on the phone. That was, that was amazing. And we'll come back for a bit, but I want to open it up a bit to the panel um, and turn to you, Jeremy, as a producer, as a documentary filmmaker, just what drew you to Brandon's story? Why this story in this moment? Why did you want to tell this story? Nice. We good? Good. good. Uh, this, uh, this is, is the first time we've viewed the documentary, documentary in any sort of, sort of public... public. Atmosphere. atmosphere. It's the first time that Brandon and I have watched it together, for sure. And I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying. And it's it's incredible for me to think about watching the story. And you know, Brandon is at David Wade Correctional Center while we're filming that, and we we got this interview on Zoom. I don't even know how we got the interview with him sorted out. But to see that, to watch that, and to watch Brandon watching that. And then to have Brandon here with us today, man, for me, that's just, I'm done. We're going, it really is such a special night. You feel that? Yes. It's just so special. Thank you for being here. We, we want to talk about these issues, too. Um, so much of what you just shared, Brandon, you know, talking about fear, talking about the society, to talking about the laws, all the all what the film talked about. The system is by design, the history of these laws, it's about preserving white supremacy very explicitly. Um, we want to talk about that and hear a little bit more about the Jim Crow Juries Project for folks who haven't heard so much about PJI's work. So Jamila, I'm wondering if you can tell us about this work, how it came to be. Um, where are we now? Because there's important developments that hopefully you can share with folks. Yeah. Um, 
So someone who worked at PJI when I started here, um, the Ramos case, where the U.S. Supreme Court said Jim Crow juries' verdicts were unconstitutional, was the 24th case he filed to the U.S. Supreme Court trying to challenge this law. A um, couple months after PJI started was when its first petition went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and you know, we're turning 10 next month. Um, this has been something that's like such a fabric of what PJI is and has been doing for all of these years. Um, but in 2018, the voters in Louisiana voted um, yes on two, which was to amend Louisiana's constitution and say, at some point in the future, we don't want this to be what we do anymore. But the problem is justice is slow. And so we get back after the law passes, it goes into effect. There are parties at the governor's office. Everyone is so excited who voted for it. And then a couple of weeks later in The Advocate, you see another person had been convicted with a non-unanimous jury verdict. Um, and it was heartbreaking because 23 times the US Supreme Court said it wasn't gonna look at this case. And right after the law changes, time number 24, the, Louis, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court hears the Ramos case. And to have conservative justices say, not only are non-unanimous jury verdicts unconstitutional, a violation of your Sixth Amendment rights to a jury trial, but they are also rooted in Jim Crow, we're talking about conservative Supreme Court justices who are saying what you did, Louisiana, what you do, is, is atrocious. Um, you know, Brandon said it, right? Um, if something's unconstitutional, it was always unconstitutional. That is exactly what the U.S. Supreme Court said in Ramos. But when asked to make it retroactive to the people who had final convictions on the day of the Ramos decision, um, they said not only were they not going to make the non-unanimous jury issue retroactive, they weren't going to make the state of Louisiana do new trials, but that never again would they tell the, any state that they had to do new trials if it was a criminal procedural constitutional violation. Never again. So not only in, did the U.S. Supreme Court really let down the 1,500 people who are in Louisiana's prisons, but they are letting down anyone in the future when someone establishes that um, an aspect of criminal procedure is unconstitutional. Um, in May, we argued before the Louisiana Supreme Court. We'll find out. Um, is this better? Does anyone know? I don't know. There's beeping. Unclear to know what is beeping. Um, in May, we argued before the Louisiana Supreme Court, and we said the U.S. Supreme Court may have let us all down, but we have a state constitution. And that state constitution says that you have to repudiate all discriminatory laws off of the books of Louisiana completely. And if the retroactivity laws in Louisiana keep 1,500 predominantly black men serving predominantly life without the possibility of parole sentences after we've said this is a Jim Crow law, then we have a problem because we did not repudiate a Jim Crow law. We are keeping people in prison. Um, we anticipated that the Supreme Court would come back in September. Uh, they have not come back yet. So every day I'm a little bit of a crazy person as we <laughs> wait for, for this determination. But um, if the Louisiana Supreme Court finds retroactivity, that are those are 1,500 people who get no trials. Um, right now we've brought home 61 people in four parishes. Um, the vast majority of whom had life without the possibility of parole sentences um, through DA negotiation. That thing that you watched not happening on the screen. Um, and we hope to bring home more, but it's nothing like what would happen if the Louisiana Supreme Court finds retroactivity um, in the Reddick case. So if Reddick is decided, those 1,500 people who never had a constitutional determination of their guilt or innocence, um, they get to come home. Uh, fundamentally, as a country, I think we all understand that if you are, uh, that you are innocent until you're proven guilty, think about this. The U.S. Supreme Court has made clear that not a single one of those folks 
was constitutionally found to be guilty. And yet they sit in prison. Uh, anyway. So hopeful, hopeful that the Supreme Court will come down soon. I can't guarantee what they're going to do. Um, you saw that state legislature. If the Supreme Court does the wrong thing, that state legislature is going to be hearing some from, from some people. And they're going to he keep hearing from those people until this is fixed. Thanks, Jamila. Um, Angelo, I, you could talk about the Reddit case, too, and the work that you did with the amicus, which would be interesting just in terms of why you think it was important to do that. But you also represent two individuals who were convicted by non-unanimous juries. One was released on parole in June, Mr. Rufus Henry, who we'd love to talk to you about a little bit more. Uh, the other is still incarcerated in Angola. So talk to us about that. You're a lawyer. How has it been for you? What are the challenges? Obviously, there are successes to talk about. Thank you. It's hard. Um, we represent two individuals who were convicted 10 to 2. They're both black men. The 10 jurors in each case who voted to convict them were white. The two jurors who voted to acquit were black. And that's by design. The entire system was set up to weaken and dilute the influence of the black juror voice so they can put more black people in jail, so they could perpetuate the plantation system, which turned into the convict leasing system. The population of Angola quintupled at the end of the 20th century. 80% of those prisoners were black men. 10% of them died. And that persists to this day. For a warden said exactly the same thing, I think, six or seven years ago. And, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight, was that the 1,500 people still incarcerated aren't statistics. They're individuals like Mr. Jackson. They have stories, dreams, they have families. That's why I'm so glad participatory defense is here tonight, recognizing that it takes a village, that these, this design, this system, this hegemony that they exert over our communities causes so much suffering. Um, and, and I got to see that firsthand when I visited our clients in Angola um, to recognize that they don't belong there, that no one belongs there. Um, one of our clients, Mr. Henry, who, who was released on parole after serving 31 years at Angola, who did not give up due to his faith and diligence, who fought and still fights to this very day, he regrets that he can't make it today, told me that he just doesn't sit around at Angola. In fact, he works on his artisanship and artistry. And I asked him, well, what kind of art do you make? And he unveiled photos of these amazing, in some cases, seven foot tall, grandfather clocks that he built with his bare hands out of matchsticks, nail clippers, and glue. I'm telling you, the pendulum swings, they are fully functional. I don't have the horological details to explain this. It's amazing, and I can't wait to show y'all pictures later. Um, but why does that, why did he have to suffer 31 years to develop that he had a craft why does our other client who reads voraciously, he spends every single day in, in Angola reading as much as he can, whatever, how to be a sports agent, how to be a teacher, how to be a record executive. Why, why, did, why did this system kill their dreams? Why did they postpone Brandon's dreams? And the reason is, is because they can. Um, it, one of the hardest things about this case was just the powerlessness to challenge something even a right-wing Supreme Court could deem unconstitutional, but were left sitting with their hands tied. Justice delayed is justice undelivered. Um, and, and that's why I'm so glad to partner with PJI um, to try and fight and end this once and for all. Thank you, Angelo. So much of this, I think, that we need to consider is, is how deliberate this is done. And what I think it should offer both, I mean, it makes you feel powerless, for sure. And it's not inevitable. The world we have now is not inevitable. People made decisions 
for it to be the way that it is. The law that we work in, so we're in the legal realm, we're going to talk about art too. The law was designed to protect white property and white power. It was written by white people to do that. And so it's working exactly as it was intended. But because it was written, because it was decided, it can be unwritten. And it can be undecided. It can be undecided. It can be challenged. It can be rewritten. And I think that's our call too, because it can feel so overwhelming. Like, my God, they wrote all of this by design. All of these systems, our carceral society, what you were saying, Brandon, in the film, you said, you know why they did this. And you asked, you know, you talked about, here I am, it's because I'm a black man that I'm here. 80% of people that we're fighting for right now, black men, that's by design. And I think part of our hope in talking about the systems this way is that it forces us then to sort of unlock our imaginations of what it is that we want, what it is that we demand. And I think if we get really crystal clear on that, there's really nothing that can stop the power of the people. We believe that. So we're, I want to dive in a little bit into something that stuck with me with the film to you, Jamila. But first, I want to ask you, Brandon, just as you're watching this film, what... What's coming up for you now? Like, you're seeing this story. You're on the other side of that story in some way. You started telling a little bit about what you're doing now, but I'm wondering, what are you thinking as you're watching this? Like, you shared a little bit, and maybe you want to share about Step Brothers and some of the work that you're doing. To be just totally honest, when I was watching that documentary. Each time I watch it, I just get emotional, but I try my best not to let the tears fall because I feel like if I let them fall, I'll be letting the 1,500 that's still behind bars down. So I gotta stay strong, not only for me, but for them too. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I hit the ground running. Um, I started the organization Step brothers, you mean step into the pinnacle of your highest performance. And I'm basically stopping young men from going through what I went through, from being in prison. Because we're dying and killing each other at an alarming rate. And I'm educating them. I'm teaching them to be men. I'm teaching them to be a better employee, a better family member, better everything overall. Become that man that society said that you're not going to be. Because there's two people that's born every day in the hospital. It's the ones that's going to succeed and the ones that's not going to succeed. And like I tell everybody, B stands for birth, D stands for death, but you can never forget C. C stands for Christ. As long as you keep Christ in front of you and do what Christ wants you to do and needs you to do, you're going to succeed. When I got sinners, man sentenced me. When that judge, I, I remember it just like yesterday, when that judge sentenced me, he sentenced me to life without the possibility a parole, probation, or a suspended sentence. And he emphasized that I would be in Angola State Penitentiary for the remainder of my life until I die. But look where I'm sitting at today. So that's why I'm so passionate about what I do. It's, it's been a lot of... Uh, bumps, it's been a lot of people trying to pull me down because they don't believe, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't really want 
individuals like me, individuals like Fox, individuals like Rob, individuals like Raw Huge, they don't want us to come out of prison and show that, hey, look what you created, look what you did. Look what, look what side we on right now. We are literally trying to save lives. We are literally trying to stop these young men from going to prison. And that's what we're going to do until the day we die. Save lives, save time, which I hear Fox and Rob talk about a lot. You're out here in the business of choosing life. Despite the systems, despite a society that at birth, you're right, tells you whether or not you're going to succeed, See, believes that it can tell you that. And you're out here saying no. And I sit here Amen. as a man with possibilities, with hope. Absolutely. And I never turned my light switch off concerning my faith. Even when they transferred me away from Angola. And Angola, you, at one time, you wasn't seeing no one go home. Only thing we seen was going to a funeral and hearing about they being buried at Point Lookout. And they have so many graveyards right now on the inside of Angola State Penitentiary. And they don't even put the name on the cross. So you don't even know who's in that, that grave. When I was confined for five years in one of the worst parts in Angola, it was Camp J. And that's why it's, 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 it's imperative, that's why it's a must. And when you use words like must, that's, that's mandatory language. I, I have to succeed in what I'm doing because my mom was there every step of the way. They had two guards beat me literally to death. And they found me the next morning unconscious. I woke up 11 days later out of a coma. And just like my mom, everything that she's been through, I mean, everything, everything that's even know how it came to be, she overcame it. And I was on my deathbed so many times in go, And every time I woke up, she was standing over me reading the Bible. And that's why I can never ever allow myself to miss sitting with my mom in the morning time, just hearing that wisdom, drinking that cup of coffee, just watching her talk to me and listening. Because you mentioned the word village. We don't, we don't have villages no more. I remember at one time, the children were scared of the parents. Now the parents are scared of the children. And we need those villages back. We need to get we need to get these laws changed. We need to get up every morning and look in the mirror and tell ourselves and ask ourselves, what can we do better? Who can I partner with? We need to get out and vote. We need we need to stop voting for people just because they attend our church. Or our family growed up with them. Or we went to school with them. We need we need people in office that's gonna be for the people. And that's the only way we're gonna that's the only way we're gonna change these laws. And just like we put them in office. We got the power to take them out of office. Look how many people died just for us to have that right to vote. That's right. There's so many things that we can, we have about 10 minutes left. I wanna get a couple more questions in and then open it up if folks wanna to chat too. Um, voting, taking to the streets, creating community organizations, showing up in village. I also wanna just bring artists into the room. Are there artists here? People who would consider themselves an artist who is a creative, yeah, Artivist. artivists. There's a lot of artivists in this space, right? And Jeremy, I want to talk to you about film. I want to talk to you about the role of art in social change. 
Um, if you can share kind of on a macro level your thoughts on that and then look around. There are artivists who want to talk to you, hear what you're saying too. Um, I'd love to share, uh, I'll answer your question, but just to answer a, f a follow up to Brandon's story about his coma, Miss Molly told me this story. So when, when Brandon was sent to Baton Rouge and he was in this coma, she would come to the hospital every day and speak to him and pray with him and be there with him. And she told me, this is crazy. She showed up one morning to the hospital and the hospital room was empty. He was, it, there was nobody in there. And you can imagine what her worst fear was at that moment. And you know what the crazy thing is? Brandon came out of his coma and they sent him back to Angola immediately before she could even see him wake up from that coma. So like when I heard her tell that story, I was like, man, that we we're talking about systems. That's kind of like next level cruelty, if you can imagine. But um, to get back to your story, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting is that um, both uh, Nick, who's here from The Lens, and myself, um, when we initially talked to Brandon about interviewing Miss Molly, it was like, well, I don't know, like, you know, you're going to have to win her over. She's in a very fragile. And, and I knew when I found out, to answer your question in a straightforward manner, when I found out that Brandon's mom was literally staying alive to see him walk out of prison. I knew, I knew what our story was. I knew what it was. And it was a matter of meeting Miss Molly and then being able to spend the time with her to listen to her. And no offense to you, Brandon, but she was our, she was the star of our, <laughs> of our story. And uh, one of the things that came out of it is that the newspaper uh, in Shreveport, the Shreveport Times, um, picked up on our documentary and our story and the editor of the newspaper said to me she's a single mom and when she saw Miss Molly's story it resonated with her in a way that she just didn't anticipate and she said my newspaper is going to stay on top of the story and they published I don't know five or six different front page stories and they followed it and um, and that was because you know Miss Molly was kind of that central voice for us and um, and people identified with what she was going through and um, and were inspired by her. And so, anyway, that's what I wanted to share. Beautiful. Um, I think part of what makes... So, CCR does a lot of litigation. We do a lot of reports. Uh, it doesn't speak like this. It doesn't create a, a sense of community like this. Stories are so powerful. Smalley's story is so powerful. Brandon, your story is so powerful. And it starts cracking, cracking these systems. And I also think it starts cracking something inside of us. Like it starts cracking something inside of us in ways that reports don't do. Legal briefs, even though they're beautiful sometimes, <laughs> don't all do the all the time. So beautiful. <laughs> Tell your story. PDM Nola knows this. Stories are super powerful. And I think combined with art, so artists in the room remember that, that there's something about unlocking also our imaginations about the world that should be, that must be, to use your words. Art does that. And I think that that's something that we want to celebrate with film and, and continue to cultivate. So artists in the room, hit us up because we want to work with you. Um, I want to just, one thing that was that I want, I'm wrestling with, uh, that I'd love Jamila, Angelo to think through, and then Obi, is it okay to have questions or, yeah? Yes, okay. <laughs> this talk about, you know, guilt, lack of evidence, or whether there is evidence, or even the opening question, did you do this? As an abolitionist, someone who believes and works towards a world without prisons, without surveillance, without police, where communities have what they need to thrive, where we've made a collective decision that what we're going to invest in is not cages, is not surveillance cameras, it's not police, but it's us, it's this, it's community, it's education and health and food 
that's the world that I'm moving towards, right? So in that world, this idea of guilt or not, mistakes or not, the choices that people make because of whatever circumstances shouldn't ever land them in a situation like this, ever. It's inhuman, it's cruel, to use your word, it's racist by design. And it has to be dismantled. It has to be abolished, in my perspective. So when we're talking about the evidence and whether or not these people were guilty or not, can you help us think through how kind of using that as either a stepping stone towards the dismantling of the system entirely, or does it somehow undermine the folks who did make a mistake, who did cause harm? And are they not also worthy of this kind of community that shows up for them, that says yes to them, we had a, one of our shows in New York was with our, our partners at an organization called Releasing Aging People in Prison or RAP in New York. And they have a film called The Interview about the parole system, that unjust, inhumane process of sitting before strangers and trying to convince them that you are more than the worst thing you've ever done, how inhuman that is, how degrading that is, how humiliating that is, how little people get to see who you are. 31 years, you're an artist, you're, you're a family member, you are, so I'm, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with this and I wonder if either of you would wanna respond. How does that land with you? Are we moving in the same direction? Can we move in the same direction by chipping away at these systems in this way? Do we lose something in that process? Yeah, I mean, nobody in this space is going to disagree that prisons are inherently unsafe places and that everyone in our community deserves to be safe and everyone in prison deserves to be safe and to have thriving lives and that punishment systems are not accountability systems, right? I, I think everybody is, is there. Um, but in the meantime, I think there is something very different. If you are sitting in prison and you know that you are there because of a Jim Crow law in 2022, and I think that that moment and that space and like yeah. that existence is such pain and is such suffering that if we don't highlight it, if we don't lift it up and if we don't say like this needs to stop and we need to bring these folks to a spot where they get a trial right? Like we're just asking for the system, like even getting the messed up system that we have, like right. just a new trial is all these folks are asking for. Um, but if we stop to say dismantle it all before dealing with the pain that you are carrying as a result of this Jim Crow conviction, a lot of unnecessary suffering that I think we can stop mm. goes on. Mm. And I just can't watch that suffering. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, I have two points. One is that, Mr. Jackson, you were accused of armed robbery for $6,000, got sentenced to life without parole. I, I saw on the news the other day, Brett Favre stole $5 million from Mississippi welfare grant. And he's a free man and probably will be forever, and we know that's why that is. And, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about in response to that question was that we wrote a brief uh, as a friend of the courts called Amicus Brief in the Reddit case uh, at the Supreme Court. Not that anything that Jamil and the good folks said wasn't legitimate and legally sound. We just wanted to offer something a little different, a little history, some a little spicier perhaps, to suggest that at the founding of the country, what we granted was something called negative rights, the right to be free from police interference, right? The right for you to have a fair trial and as against uh, the state oppression, right? But in 1864, 1865, and then the Reconstruction, um, what happened was we were granted positive rights. And I say we as black Americans, right? They said you have the right to the full enjoyment and equal protection of laws as every other white citizen. And that, go that went so far beyond freedom from bondage 
as our brief said, it, it went into the right to participate on a jury equally, the right to own property, the right to testify in court. Of course, many Louisians here know that that right wasn't uh, even close to being established until well into the 19th century. If you were a black person, you were accused, you just basically were guilty. And that continues to present day. And I don't have to tell anyone here about the 1866 massacre in New Orleans or the Colfax massacre or what happens when black Americans really try, really try to assert that we would, were entitled to the full enjoyment as every other white citizen here. And look what happened. And that very same system persists to this day. And that's why it's so important that all of us here have to keep fighting it and we have to name it and call it what it is before we dismantle it. I would love to open it up for questions, and then we'll have a, a chance for last words, and then we'll mingle, get a bit more. There's bread pudding and cookies. Do not touch the bread pudding. Don't touch it. It's gone. It's accounted for. Um, so questions for folks here. Comments too. It's just, it's an intimate crowd. I would just say thank you all. You know, thank you, Brandon, because each time that one of us tells our story, um, we are impacting the change that we're looking to see. Thank you, Jeremy, for finding um, value in this story and making the sacrifice that is required in order to bring it to the forefront. Um, so you know, it's just so many elements of each one of us plugging. It's, it's different elements of each one of us plugging the hole and doing our part. And I would just encourage everybody that is here that when I wake up in the morning, I don't look at this system or address this system or this heartache um, as uh, it's hard, it's unbearable, it's suffering. I look at it and say, if our world was perfect, what the hell would we do every day? <laughs> right? And so it gives us an opportunity to leave our names in the annals of history that when we came, it was like this. And by the time we left, our names leave, uh, is left a legacy because we did something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I say in our documentary time, success is the best revenge. So every morning when I get up and I can make them pay, I can make them pay, I can make them pay. 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 Then, then, then we're moving in the direction of saying that we don't just take a, a, a lick and lying down. It's always going to be something in our society. And I'm just grateful that God is giving us an opportunity to wake up every morning and do a little something different to dismantle the system that we know is not working in our favor. So I don't feel discouraged. I feel empowered. Mm. And when you walk out and when you make another film, when, when, when we write another amicus brief, um, we feel empowered with each one of our, our works. When we sat in the Louisiana Supreme Court and watched one of our sisters and family members, Jamila, on behalf of our partner, um, um, Thomas and Justice Initiative, deliver a most powerful blow to the Jim Crow state. I mean, you know, we walk in that power with her, yes. knowing that we're not just taking it lying down, but we're rising mm. up, and all of us here are rising up. Mm. And just like a baby. Yes, Fox. <laughs> Alice, Alice Walker, Walker, Walker says, says that the that secret to joy is resistance. The secret to joy is resistance. Keep fighting, right? right? Any other questions? I just, I just want to make a comment. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm deeply appreciated of the work you all have done. And, man, for what you've been through, as you know, what we have been through. I mean, I was wrong for convicted. I did 23 years and seven months and two days. So I provided you, right? And... I mean, I mean, to see people constantly fight, I, I just want to constantly encourage. It's like Fox said, you know, when we look at it, I mean, we, we thought about it when we was inside the prison, when we first discovered the now unanimous jury concept, right? That was brought forth. Then it was brought forth as a campaign and we changed it. You see, it couldn't be done and we did it. The law was changed. We fought, we changed that. Now. It was overturned as unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. So my thing is that, you know, in all the laws and the scribes that even we have made in the city, you know, uh, uh, folks who was formerly incarcerated, you know, as you say, the, we, we out in the community and we educate and mobilizing the, the people and empowering the people to, to make the changes that they need, right? And we have made a lot of scribes and we'll continue on to make scribes. But I want us to always keep in mind, yes, we're going to dismantle the system, 
But we got to keep in mind that Rome wasn't built in one day, right? And Rome, Rome is going to take the same time. Uh, uh, it's going to be a time period before you can untangle a lot of the things that happened that set that Rome in place, this Roman system that we are actually living in. And some of the things that we are, we're working on, we nick and picking at it, right? So we continue on the, 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 to work together in units, no matter what color we are, what gender, uh, financial positions that we're in, or positions that we are in, right? Use our positions, our wealth, our mind, our love, and our unity to destroy the system. That's how we get married. Thank you. Yes. So, what part, anybody else in the room, what part, <laughs> what part do you all believe that art plays in mental health with farming people or even while they're there? Uh, art, yeah? So the question, what role does art play in the mental health of folks who are formerly or currently incarcerated? And then there's, there's some good artists. Yeah. Brandon, you're an artist. Come on. I've seen your woodwork. Oh. It's all here. I've, I've seen your art. It give you... Hold the mic up. An escape. No, it's not working. You can hear me? Yes. It gives you an escape. Because when you just got time just to sit down and just... You're not doing anything. Your mind has a tendency to just play tricks on you, fool you, convince you, talk to you in negative ways. You you go to thinking negative. Then on top of that, you start receiving the death messages. You receive the the denials that you know. Even though you know your writ supposed to went through. You know you're supposed to uh, have it reversed and remanded, and they just stamp deny you. Like um, one year, it came over the news that uh, they just found out they weren't even reading the writs, the courthouse. They were just stamping deny you on. They were just they were just they were just they were just stamping deny because you was what you was pro se, meaning that we did our writs ourselves. So they're already intimidated. And like, mm -hmm. how can a prisoner mm. argue cases and case law like this? And he's right. Exactly. But we're not going to let society know he's right. Exactly. We don't want society to know that we have those type of individuals locked up. But what they don't understand is we're fighting for our lives. So when we branch off into the art, um, to this day, I never worked in the field in Angola. I, I never would allow myself to work in the field in Angola. Because when I, I arrived in Angola, April, I want to say the 4th, 1997, that Monday, they called work call. And when they called work call, they blow a whistle, and everybody got to go pay up in twos at the fence. And the line is like maybe, what, two or three miles long? Oh, <laughs> uh, and I, some just said, look up. And I looked up, and I seen all these 19, 20-year-old field farmers sitting on a horse with a gun. Mm. I said, no, not Miss, not Miss Molly's son. <laughs> <laughs> I turned around and went to the cell. And I stayed in the cell until they realized that, hey, he just not going to go. Just give him a duty status and give him a job. Because the time that I'm spending being a legalized slave is the time I can be studying the law. Right. Trying, to, trying to win my freedom back. And even now, I'm not free. I, I, I say this all the time. I'm quasi free because I'm still on like 18 years, 19 years of parole. And just like we sit and watch the documentary, they watched it. Right. Because if they didn't, when I made parole, they wouldn't have released me 20 minutes later. That has never happened in the history <laughs> no. 
of the penis system. Right. Uh, wow. I want to add to that. You didn't free. You're going to get them 18 years back. I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, so you're free. And yeah, we're going to talk. We're going to speak freely. I want to mm -hmm. thank PJI. I want to thank CCR with the lens, Al Jazeera. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank my amazing mother for yes. everything that she did. And you know what? 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 What really sticks out to me is when the lady said that she basically convicted me because of the way I look. Right. Gosh. When 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 she said that when I heard that the first person I thought about was Emmett Till. Right, right. right. Because you Same you thing. did take my life because of the way I yes. look. Yes. Yes. And yes. if and yes. if I didn't do nothing, wasn't I supposed to be confident? Mm -hmm. Wasn't I supposed right. to go in the courtroom exactly. with a little swag? Yeah. Right. 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 Then you come to be here. Right. Here it is. Right you got all the evidence from the man. That said that I committed a robbery from his mother's house. My name wasn't on that lease. Right. Was, you, you did fingerprints. They stood in front of the courtroom, in front of me in the courtroom, and basically looked at the judge and said, No, Your Honor, this is not the man. Mm -hmm. They caught him on the stand in several lies, and he admitted to the jury that he lied on me. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I'm not even bitter. I, 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 I don't forgive everybody that had something to do with me going to jail for 25 and a half years because you don't create a beast. You don't create a monster. Yeah, they ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen like nothing yet. Add to the piece of, in your documentary, the young lady, she said that Oof. I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I didn't want my appearance on here, my image, because, because of my bosses. I remember one time uh, I had called the courts in Cattle Parish about a mother that her son had gotten sentenced to um, death row at 17. And um, she had a conversation over the phone about one of the jurors and was convicted of jury tampering. And they said it was her 15 years in prison. And as someone who had been charged and, and convicted of jury tampering, I called the judge and expressed to the judge that I thought the sentence was excessive and unfair. And the receptionist says to me, um, um, you want me to leave what message? Oh, this is my name. Yes, you know, um, take that down. And then the lady asked me, she says, and, 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 and where do you work? Mm, wow. Who's your boss? Wow. I said, who is my boss? What does it have to do with me calling you saying and I'm a voting citizen and I don't like how she charged, how she sentenced, I'm a voting citizen and I don't like how she charged, um, sentenced that woman. So, you know, just to hear wow. her ask me, right. who is your boss? Yeah. So, what she true. experienced is true. Yes. Yeah. The first thing they want to know in a small town like where we're from is who controls you, who you answer to. So I can call them and get you in check. Right, right, right. Who mm -hmm. your mask? Right. Yeah. I, I'm picking cotton on Jeff Bezos' plantation right now. <laughs> she's, she's right. She's right. And there's a lot of things that. And I love the way she just expressed it. Right? Yeah. Um, what a it's just like you asked what a lot of the things that, you know, we can tap. Jury instructions. Jury instructions. Because jury instructions. Because they don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand the law. And if you ask them one of the terms or what the judge means, they wouldn't even be able to tell you, but they said that you're being judged by your peers. Right. Ten of them didn't look like me. Mm -mm. Right. But those were the ten that voted for me to go to prison for the rest of my life. And I, I'll never forget how the judge looked when they came with a guilty verdict. When they said guilty, he looked at them like, are you sure? And, the, and, the, and another, I've been trying my best to find it, but right after they had found me guilty, the district attorney made a statement in the newspaper. I want to say it was the Inquisitor. He said that he couldn't believe that he won. But his, 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 the last thing he said in that long article, he said, but rest assured, you will see him again. Yeah. So that was confirmation to me from God, speaking through him, and he, he didn't even know it. And I kept it 
just like over 25 and a half years, I kept every letter my mom wrote me. I got a, I got a big black trash bag. Every letter, every card she ever wrote me. And my tribute to her, like you said, leave something. I'm going to take all those letters that my mom wrote me and I'm going to put them in a memoir because you have to understand that when you, you're not the only one incarcerated, mm -hmm. they, yes. they need to understand that you're not just destroying my life. You, you, my mama taught school for 25 and a half years, but almost 26 years. And when I went up for parole the first time, they denied me. And I had everything. I had 30 degrees, 30 diplomas. I had been without a uh, RVR, which is a write-up for so long, and they denied me. Two voted for me to go home, one voted for me not to be released. And that same night, she had a heart attack in Walmart because she couldn't handle it. And when I got that news, it put me in a spot to where, it put me in a bad spot, a negative spot. I had already gave a life sentence back, now I was working on a 40 which I suppose they had went straight home, but they didn't give me the good times. If you were locked up in 1996, you fall up under what you call the good time act, act 138, but they didn't give it to me. So they basically wanted me to do the 40 years flat. So I would have had another, what, 19, close to 20 years to do. Uh, and by the grace of God, I met Jeremy, I met Jamila, I met Nick, I met baby Jeremy, Miss Layla, <laughs> I met the times, the, 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 and I'll never forget what, what Jeremy said to me one time when I, they called me up to the office. He said, uh, he said, Brandon, he said, uh, I seen your documentary. He said, and I can honestly say that and you didn't do nothing and you innocent. He said, I'm not going to stop fighting until you get out. He said, he said I'm family now. And he's been family ever since. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to thank him. Here's to family. Here's to community. Thank you all so much on that note. Welcome home. We're so glad you're here. And we're going to keep fighting until everyone gets home. Follow PJI. Keep in touch with us. Follow PDM NOLA, get involved. There's a lot of folks here. If you don't know each other, get to know each other. We're gonna wrap up soon, but you have time to mingle, to enjoy. Um, thank you again so much, Jamila, for hosting us. Thank you to Obi for organizing this. Um, it's such an honor to be here with you all tonight. And thank you. So if you are going to close, we would gonna... love to close in our tradition. Yes. Louisiana fans. Yes. If you would, please stand to your feet and repeat these words. Yes. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. Yeah. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Come on now. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our